Good morning, brethren. Um, I've chosen the topic, the glory of his power, um, for this renewal. Um, this verse really hit me really hard because it's a, it's a part, it's a facet of his glory that we don't really focus on a whole lot. It's his wrath. Second Thessalonians 1 9 says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Considering that his glory and his power is unsurpassed, unlimited, fair and just, all encompassing, is it's definitely a fair assumption that this is glory. I mean, what can God not do? He is God. The only thing I can think of that he cannot do, that we can do, that he cannot do, is sin. And that is not something to be proud of in the least. We, don't, we do not take pride in, in sin, and we do not wish to continue sinning either. In fact, knowing the fact that he can resist temptation, that he's incapable of sinning, and that he cannot tempt others, and he has the power to, the power to overcome sin, makes him even more powerful. He is so powerful he can't sin, he can't tempt. Wouldn't it be great to be that powerful? But then, where would God get his glory from? Another point that's worth mentioning is that Satan doesn't make us sin. This is something that I, I've started, started to think about, but he does not make us sin. He does not cause us to sin. He doesn't have ultimate power like God does over us. He does not have that power over our actions. He isn't called the sinner because he sins us. He's called the tempter because he tempts us. We do the sinning. When we shift the focus to him, then, there's, then obviously we're just going to go to heaven. I mean, and sin, I mean, sin is negated. There's no sin. But I'll discuss that a little later. There are different powers that the world fears. Nuclear attacks, terrorism, government, etc., etc. But there is one power that is, that is so being ignored. And, that, and sometimes to the point of almost being unheard of. And that's the power that God has to judge us. The power of his judgment is one that we fear the most and the one that we look forward to the most. There's an old children's song that says, one door and only one, yet its sides are two. I'm on the inside, and which side are you? When he issues forth that final judgment, there are two places you're going to be. And saying in the doorway is not one of them. It's going to be either you're on the inside or you're on the outside. But that power to determine that he has, but the power he has to determine whether a person go to heaven or hell is quite the power to fear. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us just how strong God is. The weakness of God is stronger than man's strength, and the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. That automatically implies there's an infinitesimal gap between our peak strength and God's lowest point of weakness. And there is no low point of God's weakness because there's no, well, because the high point is his high point. There is no low. It's one straight line. We used to have a little scatter plot for us, and there's like, okay, there's some there and some there. But then that gap between our peak and his bottom is infinitesimal. And how much even more infinitesimal is the gap between our weakness and his strength? That is even more humility. The type of power of strength that the world considers powerful is based upon contests such as the world's strongest man contests. Yes, the physical, earthly power and strength that these men have is quite impressive. I mean, pulling a 747 for 100 meters in 20 seconds that's pretty impressive. But God's power is infinitely greater. When he speaks, the very foundations of the earth tremble. Amen. There is something else in that power that fills us with awe and wonder. And that's when we are finally granted access to heaven. The glory that awaits us is so indescribable that God would have had to stoop to the level. He would have to come down to our level to describe that glory. That is why he sent John. He said, John, I want you to come up to me. I want, you to, I want you to see heaven, what will be, it will be like. He used metaphors and similes so that we would be able to understand it. Can you imagine even 100 years ago, back when there's a, well, even when there were less periodic table of elements, what if God said in Revelation, and the walls are made of Einsteinium? And we're like, what's Einsteinium? There, there is no, you wouldn't be able to describe it. So he has to say, it is like this. It is like a pearl. It is like crystal. He describes what will happen in the end times. A third of the stars will fall. A third of the moon will die. A third of the earth will disappear. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, says 2 Thessalonians 1.8. 
That's just the appetizer to the power of his everlasting destruction that he will dish out. We could discuss for hours on end about this power and how magnificent and astonishing it is to our frail minds. The power of destruction he can issue forth is so intense. It's so intense that Paul told the Thessalonians, we pray always for you that God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the works of faith with power. I find the power he has to bring us into this world and take us out of it and then to keep us alive, if necessary, in the lake of fire as just the beginning, just enough, just enough to make me fear the power that he has over everything. Back in early May, I was discussing with a couple uh, brethren about the power of God and how, and how much it fills with us all. One of them is a microbiologist major at Purdue University, and the other one is a higher math education major at Tri-State University in Angola. One of them said, the, the, because the, everything to them has to be finite, it's very definite. One, one of the things that one of them said was, I don't understand, or I struggle with the fact, is time. The concept of time is, I don't understand it. God exists outside of time. He is time. He is not bound by time. He controls time. Four different, four completely opposing opposites. It's like north, south, east, and west. Completely four different ends. But he, but time exists, but we cannot understand how in the world he exists outside time and is time. The other gentleman said, this is probably why he is so powerful. The fact that he doesn't exist in time is so powerful. He holds time in his hand. He could crush it. That's why he's so powerful. In six, day, in six days, he created the heavens and the earth. He probably could have done it in less. I'm very, I'm very, very convinced that he could have done it in less time. In six days, Con Selmer, a very high, highly manufact, uh, manufactured instruments, are able to make two bass trombones, which are very difficult to make. In six days, I can create a simple program that plays tic-tac-toe with you. But God, in six days, created the heavens and the earth. That is quite a bit to do in six days. And like I said earlier, I mean, we have the power to pull a seven, people have power to pull 747s, 100 meters in 20 seconds, and God shows his strength by shaking the foundations of the earth. Last night, Brother Al stated that whenever God manifests himself, his glory is seen. And the power of his glory can be seen every single time you open the Bible. The very first glimpse of this glory is, when, is in his words when we see creation. He has the power to give life, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. God has the power to take that life away. Acts 12, 21 through 23. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in his royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration to them. And immediately, in, no, and the people gave a shout and saying, This is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up his ghost. God has the power to be merciful to us. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his vent through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He also has the power to be very vengeful. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, To me belong of vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. God has an infinite power. So why do people turn away from him? Now, I tend to believe that as because his power is unbelievable and so unsurpassed and infinite that it is impossible for people to believe. We could say Michael Jordan, for instance, at the top of his career, probably making 8% of his shots, is probably scoring three-fourths of the points for the Chicago Bulls. But there's that 20%, that 25% that made him human to us. He made him real. If he, he scored every single shot he ever took, if he made all those shots, he would have set the bar at perfection. At being competitive people, we want to be better than everyone else, typically. But if the bar is set perfection, why, is there, why do we want to try to strive beyond perfection? There, there's no point. It's like, well, we might as well not try. There's no believing that there is beyond perfection. If we can't reach perfection, how do we reach the level of God? And since we are being capable of being more powerful of God, more than, say that again, since we are incapable of being more powerful than God, 
Men have thus concluded he cannot exist. This is what we are told. He, he created creation. That's way too much power for one, one power for one being. Just way too much. That cannot be. No matter what type of being that is. Even the Greek and Roman gods were not completely powerful. This is why pe people believe they existed. And why they believed in their powers. Because they had imperfections that made them believable. There's not one god that had more power than, had more power than the others who was over all the other gods. They all worked on the same level. How about this? How about in 1 Samuel, when the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant? Brother Boyce mentioned this this morning as well in his sermon. Um, the Israelites saw it would be a good idea to take the Ark into, into the battle. No, I would have done the same thing. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, God's right there with us in the front battle lines. I mean, we're going to win this battle, no, no problem. Well, the Philistines come in, they steal the Ark of God, and the sons of the high priest are killed. And Eli finds out about it, and he falls, and he breaks his neck. The Ark of the God was then taken from, from camp to camp in the Philistine country. The first country, there was a lot of death, a lot of destruction. They said, get it out of here. So they, moved, so they then moved it to Ashdod, which is the home of their god, Dagon. So they say, well, we wish to worship this god alongside our god. So they set the Ark of the Covenant next to their god, Dagon. Not quite a bright idea. In the morning, there was Dagon stretched out before the Ark of the Covenant in a bow, bowing position. The Philistines say, this is kind of weird. So they set him back up, set Dagon back up. Next morning, there's Dagon again. This time, not only just stretched out before God, he is smashed. His hands are cut off, laying on the threshold of the, of the temple. From that point on, the high priest and any people who walked in that temple would walk around the threshold of, the temp, of, of Dagon because of the desecration that happened to their God. And then they figured, you know what, this, this is too powerful. The Ark of the Covenant is too powerful. God is too powerful for us. We have to get him out of here. So for the next seven months, the, the Ark of the Covenant moved around from camp to camp until the Philistines finally caught on that they are not going to be able to control this power. So they finally gave it back to the Israelites and said, you know what, we can't control it. God is obviously with you. You can have him back. And this is why they liked their, their, their god, Dagon, because he was controllable. If they really wanted to, they could have erased him from history. So, oh, Dagon, he was smashed to bits. So, we have this new god over here, and he is going to be called whatever. They're, they were able to create their god, make him three-dimensional, make him tangible. And like I said, if they, their gods did, did something they didn't like, and I say did loosely because they didn't do anything. They were, they were a monument to something, which we do not know. And they probably didn't know either. When I mean, their gods did something, they could just erase them out of history and replace that god with another. But our god has withstood every attempt by man to erase him from history. What other god or celestial being can we say has withstood that trial time and again? There is none. If nothing else, does this not make God the best? If, there is, if not for his glory, if not for his power, if nothing about God except for the fact that he has been able to stay in history and not be erased out at all, does this not make him great and glorious? <coughs> now, I mentioned earlier about the wrath of God, and I, don't want to ish on, I do not wish to end on a sour note, but one power that he has that we do not tend to like to hear about or discuss many times is the power he has to condemn us to the lake of fire. We avoid this facet because we don't like the fact that God has that power. I won't expound on it into great detail, but it does need to be brought into the picture since this power does exist. Once saved, always saved is a very popular belief among many young, foolish Christians. Only, I've noticed that the teachers of this doctrine do not call it once saved, always saved. They say, God will forgive you no matter what you do, as long as you ask for forgiveness. End of story. There's, no, there's nothing else beyond that. It's just, if you ask for forgiveness, you'll be forgiven. There's no, well, you have to try to stop sinning. There's nothing else that you have to do. Just say, I'm sorry. And that's it. The, grave, the grace that God has offered to us is in this case being used as a token to sin. We see, we see many nonsensical terms that make us feel better about the sins we commit. And 
these, these terms make our sins seem relatively unimportant. You would be called a secondary virgin if you had sex outside of marriage and you decided not to have sex again until you become married. You're still an adulterer. You would be considered to be living an alternative lifestyle if you're a homosexual. You're still a homosexual offender. You would be considered a dancer if you worked at a club where you sell your body for the pleasure of others. You're still a prostitute. All of these are singled out as condemning sins. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. He is going to judge every single one of us, from the least to the greatest of us, from the seemingly least significant sin to the seemingly most significant sin. He will not tolerate sin in his house. He will not let sin enter through those pearly gates. He will not allow such things to abound in the new heaven. He has no problem casting sin and any who sin into the lake of fire. I remember a renewal several years ago, one brother just said, hell was described as a place where fire, the fire is so thick and the heat is so intense. You place your hand in your face and you can't feel it and you can't see it. You burn, but you do not die. You feel intense heat. But just as Abraham told the rich man, there's a great chasm between there and here. We cannot give you even a drop of water to cool your tongue. Back in the winter, I was reading an article about temperatures and global warming. And some scientists have decided that heaven is hotter than hell. Because, here's their point, the sun is really hot. God created the sun. Therefore, the sun is less hot than God is. Therefore, heaven has to be really hot. And it has to be hotter than hell. This is assumed because of the infinite power God has and the infinite glory he has. After all, if he can breathe and the foundations of the earth tremble, if his glory is the light of heaven and the reflection of his glory off the face of Moses was so intense that Moses' face had to be covered with a veil, and that God's glory was seen in the burning bush, it was concluded that fire, such as the sun, was less intense than God's glory. Therefore, heaven is higher than hell. But we know this to not be true. This is another one of those crazy things that have been displayed to people in order to deter us from Christianity. God is just too powerful for the ungodly to understand. It makes sense to them that since God is so great, heaven has to be hotter than hell. In the end times, someone who, someone who is not Christian, praising God day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is too boring, it's too monotonous, it's too redundant. There are other things you're going to want to do in heaven, right? No. We're going to be, praising, we're going to be wanting to be praising God day and night. Not because we have to. I don't recall reading anywhere in the Bible where it says, and God said to them, when you come to heaven, you will be required to praise me day and night, or you will be cast back into the lake of fire. I don't think it says that in the, anywhere in there. It says we are going to because we are going to want to praise God. Amen. Once we've been spewed out of the mouth of God, we don't get to go back in. And this is a good illustration right before lunch. You eat your food, you find it disgusting, so you spit it out. Are you going to put it back in your mouth? No. God says, this is disgusting, I don't want it back in my mouth, he's going to throw it away. This is not a comforting thought to us, to know that once we've been spit out, we've been spit out. We're going to be, we're going to be disposed of, and very well. God has the power to completely wipe our existence from history, from anything. As I was saying about other gods, if we didn't like them, we could erase them from historical record. But we cannot do that with our God. He won't let that happen. But however, he has that power to do that to us. He can erase us from history and to erase us from complete existence. The gods of the Greeks, the gods of the Greeks and Romans became obsolete and negated from use. But we still know of them today. When God erases us from history, we erase from the minds of any previous histories. Now I work at a camp between for kids who have disabilities between ages of 8 and 18. This is a very big part of my life. As a returning staff me member, one of my duties is to help train new staff. I get asked many questions that I've noticed that most of them come from the fear of something they do not know or understand. It's very much the same with God's power. It's something that many do not understand because it's so infinite. Once they become accustomed to hearing it, though, they learn more about it. They want to know more about it. They want to do more, learn more, hear more. I see the same thing at camp. Like, for instance, we have a 50-foot climbing tower. I get asked a question, a question like, 
If the kid cannot climb the wall because he's not able to, do we let the rest of the kids climb it and he does something else? The answer is no, we do not do that. We find a way for him to climb that wall. God said, we, we, God saw that there's no way for us to do this. He's not going to say, well, person A over here, he just can't do it. He's not going to get a chance. I'm not going to give him a chance whatsoever. Everyone else, though, you guys can go ahead. He's going to, he offered that chance to us. He, gave, he provided a means to the end, and he did that through his son, Jesus. He sent his son to die for us to provide the means to the end. Why and how? Because he is God. He did it because he is God. He loves us. He wants us to be there. Because he can do it and because he wants to do it is why he did it. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask of it? God is truly glorious and powerful.